Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And before we talk about today's guest, who I'm really excited to talk about, because we are we're all going to grow. We're all going to start in the beginning of this podcast as little seedlings, and then we're going to grow into big oaks, because our guest is an expert on human growth potential. But I, I'd be a miss. Is it a miss or a remiss if I did not introduce properly my co-host, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, I don't know why you're not, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm excited, and you know what? <clears throat> We're going to make an instant connection in 90 seconds. I know it. I, I, you know what? I'm, I'm actually skeptical about an instant connection in 90 seconds. What, I, will tell you, I will tell you, I jumped on when you guys, you and our guests were, were chit-chatting, and I could see in 90 seconds there was an instant connection there. I saw it. So yeah. I can I talk it? <laughs> uh, no, you can't talk it, Nicholas. We have to properly introduce you. Well, the 90 seconds is up, so I'll see you later, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great podcast with our guest, Nicholas Boothman from nicholasboothman.com. Now, if you don't know who Nicholas is, he's a big deal. Um, he basically speaks all over the world, has books that's been translated into more than 30 languages, but his hottest business speeches are how to connect in business in 90 seconds or less and become socially smarter by the minute. More than 500 corporations, thousands of small businesses, and six of the world's leading business schools have contacted Nicholas Boothman to rally and inspire their staff to take risks, connect, communicate, and articulate their business ideas. All the way from a farm near Toronto, Canada, Nicholas Boothman, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Boy, that was a long introduction. Anyway, here I am. The 90 seconds are up. How do we feel about each other? I, I feel great about you, actually. Um, and I can even say, before we started the podcast, when we um, were not recording, um, you, you, you're a likable guy, Nicholas Boothman. I don't know, but it's just, maybe it's just your personality. Maybe it's the accent. I don't know what it is. Hmm. But... Um, no. You're the kind of guy you want to, you want to just go to the, the pub with, have a beer, and just talk. But I think that you're doing something, and I want to know, what the hell are you doing, Nicholas, to make these instant connections? Oh, you know, okay. Well, in fairness to your listeners, because, I, because in your, in, when you invited me, you said, see you at the podcast. So I thought it was going to be visual, and, and, uh, and scampered at the last minute to comb my hair and put a camera here. So we, we should tell your listeners we can actually see each other. Uh, which is which makes a big difference because we're talking here about face-to-face -face communication and it's very different than doing it over the phone which if you want we can talk about also however what am I doing well you know what I'm doing basically things mo mostly things that babies do uh, when they're when they're happy look them in the eye smile open your body language which I was doing and we could see each other and the big one which we did in about 15 seconds was well do you know what it was <laughs> I don't know, because I wasn't aware of it. Mark has got his, you put me on the spot look on his face, guys. Okay, well, what I did, was, it's simple. We found common ground within 15 seconds. That's all we did. The moment we found common ground, we talked about Phoenix. We talked about restaurants that I'd been to. Uh, I asked you, because you appear to be on a treadmill whilst we're doing this. I asked you if you're on a treadmill. So we found common ground. And immediately, it's like we were cousins or something. And we, because I talk a lot about assuming rapport. And we assumed rapport. I talk to you like I've known you, you know, for ages. That's all. And you talk back the same way. Now, did I blow it when I kind of, you know, said in a, in a sort of, you know, maybe sarcastic tone, sitting's the new smoking because you weren't on a treadmill desk. And you're like, well, I guess I'm smoking. No, I mean, you, you know, I give you some credit for your age or your youth or whatever, because, because the, the younger you are, sometimes the more, sort of, no, you're fine. You know, you felt relaxed and relaxed enough to say that. And so, yeah, you actually probably synchronized my attitude, which is a big thing when, when you're making connections with people. 
If you do it stiff and formal, it's stiff and formal. If you assume rapport, which is talk to somebody as if they're your favorite cousin or someone you haven't seen for ages, and you just assume rapport, that's how great communicators do it. They just have, you know, you're born that way. You, they just haven't had it scared out of them growing up. People who can naturally communicate just haven't had their natural face-to-face uh, -face skills scared out of them. That being said, that some people have parents that scare their skills out of them by the time they've reached three or four years old. Uh, so not everybody's natural born skills are intact. How, how does that happen? Oh, listen, um, we come into this world with what I call uh, five, we come with our five senses, obviously, but we come with five super senses. Um, and they are uh, enthusiasm. We're all born with enthusiasm. Of course we were, otherwise we'd never have made it out. Um, curiosity, uh, which is a human survival skill. Uh, the ability to process feedback. In other words, take that, what your curiosity handed you and what your senses hand you and, and, uh, and, and, and make it better, use feedback. Empathy, the ability to see and feel and hear the world through the senses of others. And imagination, the greatest super sense of all. Imagination rules the world because when you can capture someone's imagination, you've, you've got them, absolutely. So uh, by the time a kid is three or four years old, Many times, their natural born curiosity has been wiped out of them by well-meaning and sometimes not so well-meaning people saying, why are you asking so many questions? Blah, 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 blah. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Be quiet. Leave me alone. When nobody told these parents that that is why God invented red wine. Don't worry about your kids asking all those questions. Have another drink. You know, it's so funny because my, my, my baby was six months old. That's what I would do because when I'd come home from work. I would have to have a glass of red wine to like calm down. Well, no, I mean, give it to the kids. <laughs> no, oh, give it to the kids. Yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. That's, such, that's such a European thing to say. Scott Todd, what do you think? Well, that's how you give it to the kids and that's how you, you, uh, you enrich their imagination, right? I'm clean their teeth. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's all good. <laughs> no, I mean, you guys, cause I dialed in, I jumped on the call just, I don't know, a minute or two later. And I could tell, like I said, Mark, that you guys had, had a connection. And I think that uh, Nicholas is right. I mean, it's, it's, you found common ground because when I jumped on, you guys were, were talking about restaurants in Phoenix. And it's, it's almost like uh, you guys were buddies and had been hanging out for a long time, literally within, I don't know what, less than 90 seconds, right? Well, 15, 20 uh, seconds. So it's, it's not, it's not there. And I, I think that, I, I mean, Nicholas, I think you're right. When it comes to these, to these senses, you know, I think that, you know, the, the curiosity, we, we get that kind of beat out of us. Uh, you know, e even the ability to be interested in other people and talk to other people, because what, what do we teach kids? Stranger danger, right? We, we don't want them talking to strangers because yeah. our people are dangerous, right? So that you grow up as an adult, you're like, I don't want to talk to anybody. These people are scary. <laughs> Well, the total age of my children is 208. So I've got quite a few years of parenting experience. And, you know, instead of saying, don't talk to strangers, I know it, this might sound a little crass, but don't talk to strangers who've got a knife in their hand or, or got their trousers around their ankles. Uh, you know, we should get a little bit more precise about, about what we're talking about. We just tell everybody, strangers, especially men these days, unbelievable, Men are, are dangerous and, and don't go near them. Oh, all this rubbish. It's absolute nonsense. Look, you know, and I do know what I'm talking about. I've, I've raised a, a lot of children and, you know, three of my kids are nearly in their 50s. So what can I say? Anyway, can I just go back to something you said at the beginning? Yeah, you absolutely. You mentioned that we are going to, did you say you're going to, we're going to plant some seeds today? Is that what you said and grow? We're going to plant some seeds. And we're going to grow. So we're, we're yeah. starting off, right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, uh -huh. so... I'll, 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 90 seconds we're growing yeah no absolutely and i'll tell you something because i just spoke uh, i just did two big gigs recently or three uh, well four i did two in lisbon portugal at what was called the happy leadership conference where leaders came from all over the world and I, then i did two as i mentioned to you in uh, in scottsdale last week and i start off by asking people um i'll run through it quickly now but i asked my audience we're all talking about happiness these days. So what actually does make people happy? Well, the answer to that question, which I usually set my audience up with, is that um, after putting 1,824 people in a functioning MRI, 
asking them questions and studying their brain reactions, what they came up with was this. We have two types of happiness, short-term moments of happiness and long-term happiness. Short-term moments of happiness, human beings get, we get our biggest short-term moments of happiness when we are looking forward to something we want and the outcome is unknown. In other words, I'm going to go to a new restaurant, I'm going to get married, I'm going to go on holiday, I'm so looking forward to this holiday, I'm so looking forward to this new restaurant tonight, I'm so looking forward to this concert, I'm so looking forward to the draw with my lottery tickets, blah, blah, blah. That gives us moments of happiness. In other words, where there's a slight risk involved. But what is it that gives us long-term happiness? What, and, and there was a lot of research done and about what, what are the happiest countries and what are the least happy countries. What they found out along the way was they actually discovered the single activity that gives the most happiness to the most people in the most countries over the longest time. That, what do you think it might have been? I, I was going to say camping? No, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> the, the, look, it's, it's, I'm a professional speaker, so every question is set up. Um, it was actually gardening. Gardening, yeah, if you don't garden, you don't get it. If you do garden, if people get, they totally get it, which is really an extension of the first thing. You plant something, you look forward to what's happening, blah, 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 blah. Where am I going with this? Well, it's simple. My wife is a passionate gardener. We live on a farm. She has acres of all kinds of, of organic gardens. I am not a gardener. However, perhaps we are all gardeners. Perhaps all we do in this life is plant seeds of ideas and relationships and make them grow. That's because all business, no matter what you do, is about taking good ideas to market. In other words, planting ideas, seeds of ideas in other people. Your show is, is an idea which is growing. The relationships you create are growing. So yes, absolutely, you're bang on. We are planting seeds, and that's all we do is plant seeds of ideas and relationships and help them grow and watch them grow and pull the weeds out. I actually have a garden. So you get it. And I'm a horrible gardener. Like, I, you know, like I've got it all like, like, I, you know, you don't know, you don't know me, but I'm all about automation. Right. It's like yeah. my favorite word after free. Or it's my favorite word. And then my second favorite word is free. So, you know, I've got the drip system going, you know, like it's, it's all kind of automated. Like there's not much for me to do. Like what true gardener, I think goes out and, you know, messes with it more than I do. And they care. They care. Yeah, but, but, they care. but you get the idea. You get, look, I, I think the tractor is the greatest invention ever made because people used to do that stuff. Now a little tractor can do the work of 100 horses and 500 people. But anyway, there we go. No, I, 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 lo I love the analogy. I love the concept. I didn't know that gardening made people so happy. Um, that's, that's actually shocking to me. Um, yeah. I, I did read a study that the the one thing that made happy families was actually they all had in common like they had a you know a bunch of attributes that made happy families but the one thing that made them all in common was families that camped together um assuming they like camping right assume, well yeah we'll assume they like, they like camping but there's something about getting you know uh you know getting away from it all getting uh you know back to nature mm. um having to, to solve problems right putting things try selling that one in syria right now Right, exactly, exactly. I think it yeah, depends on the camping. So, uh, Scott Todd, what are you? What are your thoughts about you know the gardening? And then, Scott, I'd be curious just to ask you because you're coming from a Fortune 300 background. What makes a great leader? And then I'm going to ask Nicholas what he thinks makes a great leader because obviously he's the expert. You know, I th I think what makes a great leader is uh, or let's go back to gardening first. I'm not a gardener. I don't I don't know if I have the patience for gardening. But you know what I do I do think about like my business today as I'm gardening because I realize like when I do mailings that it, I'm planting a seed for you know six weeks from now, and I'm excited to see what what harvests through there. You know, in terms of of buying land. Um, but then getting over to, to leadership, I think that what makes a great leader is uh, s someone who is really um, focused on their people and helping their people to grow. Because look, at the end of the day, I mean, we're, we're all, especially in a corporate environment, you're there to do a job. And look, work is not fun, right? Like work is mundane and boring. You can game. Sorry, whoa, 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 whoa. Was that a question? <laughs> 
Was that a question? No, it's not a question. It's a statement. Well, no, work is fun for me. Work is fun for a lot of people. Well, I think, okay, well, look, t- today, my work, today my work is fun because I, I own, I control it, okay? Yeah. I think that if you're, if you're working in a corporate environment and you're told, like, this is what we are going to go do, well, then I think it's up to the leader in that organization to, to build, build the work to be fun because when, when you're getting hammered, by customers all the time. I don't know that it's as fun as, you know, maybe the work that you do today or the work that I do today. I, I enjoy what I do today. Um, as, a, as a leader, what I enjoy doing is I enjoyed helping my people to grow and to build their skill sets and then to help them to find ways to gamify that work, find ways to make that work fun and enjoyable by having that, that larger mission, you know, putting them on a mission of here, here, we're going to go do this, this task. And we are delivering value to people. I mean, I, this company I worked for, we, we provided travel solutions for, for people to get to where they need to be. And, you know, relating that back to, Hey, how do, how does your job that you're doing here impact the world or impact people? Just one even individual person helping them to, to get on their way and to get home. I think that when you can, when you can frame the work that way and show the importance of the work and not for the company, but for an individual or for a person or to make the world a better place, just one person at a time. That's really, I think the role of the leader. It's not necessarily it's not, the, the leader is not necessarily there to kind of oversee and shepherd the work. The leader is there to, to help the people that they're leading to grow and to, to build and to prosper and to, to help make that impact and to deliver them the employees to where, Hey, you know what? At the end of the day, under this guy's leadership, we got stuff done. I feel good about the work that I did. And you know what? As a, as a person, I'm a much better person than before he came along. Nicholas Burton, what are your thoughts? Well, two, number one, a leader is someone who knows what to do and does it. That's my first thought. Plenty of people in this world know what to do and don't do it. Nobody in this world has to be told how to lose weight. They just don't do it. Okay. Um, but number two, and I think you, you touched on it, Scott. Uh, here's, when people, purpose, projects, and passion come together, potential and confidence go through the roof, fear and doubt go out the window, and profits pile up at the door. It's a leader's job to bring together people, purpose, projects, and passion. And it's not as difficult as it might sound. Interesting. Interesting. So I'd be curious. You always want want someone when you finish saying something profound to say, hmm, interesting. I I, I, I like the answer. Um, I want to go go a little bit deeper with it, though. Okay. Um, I want to kind of reverse it in the sense that, you know, you go all around the world, you talk to all these people, you know, big companies. What is, what is it that you see that they're missing? Like why, you know, what's, what are they all yearning for? What are they learning? What are they, what do they, what do they really want out of, out of, you know, that experience of, you know, rapport and leadership and growth from, from someone right. like Meaning, they want meaning, but you know what meaning, uh, the simpler word than meaning, Pe- we, human beings can't live without projects, okay? This is your project or one of your projects. If a chap jumps out of bed or a chapess, a woman jumps out of bed in the morning and doesn't have a project, what are you supposed to do? You come equipped to do projects, okay? We come born with everything we need to do projects. Now, hopefully your project, it meets your purpose. If your purpose, and I have a very simple, I, simple scheme I do for people to find out precisely what they're good at precisely what they were born to do. In my case, uh, I, I only figured this out when I was about 49, and now I teach it to all sorts of people. I have, I, I, here's my quick, I don't know how we're doing for time, but here's my, here's my quickie on this. Imagine if uh, for a few seconds before you were born, you found yourself in a lineup. In your hand, you had a piece of paper. You had to write down why you deserve to be born on that piece of paper. You write down something, you get to the front, they look at your piece of paper, they either say, not good enough, go to the back and try again. Or they say, that's great, you can get born now. They send you to the supply department to outfit you for the trip, and you get born. Unfortunately for you, they tear up your piece of paper and wipe your memory. So here you find yourself like everybody else, knowing you're uniquely equipped for something, but you don't know what it is. 
I figured out for myself and a lot of people, it changed their life. What was on my what was on my piece of paper in there? On my piece of paper was I make complicated concepts sound simple and interesting. That's it. I've done it since I was a kid. I spent my life at school standing in the corridor because the teacher would say something and I said no one would get it. I said, why don't you just say do 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 we'll all get it? Said Nikki Boothman, go and stand in the corridor. I told you not to do that. However, that's what I do. Well, one day I figured it out. I stopped being a photographer. Now I write books and give speeches and talk to people and I make what are actually very complicated concepts sound simple and interesting. So when, you, when a leader can find in each person, I call it your, your purpose statement. What's your purpose statement? And then put the projects, attach them to that. Everything else is easy. Yeah, it kind of, kind of reminds me of that, uh, that Simon Sinek book, Start With Why. Have you read that? No. Uh, it's a TED Talk too. I, th- I think you would love it, actually. Because he, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he starts with purpose. Right, for people who start, you kind of start with, hey, I want to make a lot of money, right? Yeah, I understand. It's not sustainable. Um, all right, so I want to I want to ask you a tough question, Nicholas. Mm-hmm. You ready? Okay. Tell us something we don't know about risk and rapport by design. Well, we are all. Human beings are energy systems in nature. That's all we are. We are we're just energy. And like all energy systems, we only have two settings. We're either growing or we're going, growth or decay. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Whether you're, in a, whether you're a program like yours, whether an economy, a country, a loving relationship, a flower, you're either growing or you're going. Uh, and the only way human beings grow is when there is a slight whiff of danger in the air. It is the only time your brain gets a signal to come alive and grow. And so what I say about risk is that uh, the the only time we grow when there's a slight whiff of danger in the air. There are varying degrees you can go to get a whiff of danger in your air. The biggest and the best one, if you're up for it, which is the one I did, is burn all your bridges so you can't make make the income you were making in the past. I sold my cameras. I had five kids, three at, at university. I sold my cameras. Now I have to change, write my books, and become a speaker. That was a big risk. But you know what? It wasn't a risk at all because I knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel. As far as rapport, by design, take risks. Meet seven new people every day. Go and introduce yourself to people. But it's that simple. How, how would you introduce yourself to Scott Todd? Well, okay. In what situation? There's a, there are closed. Oh, wait a minute. There are closed fields and there are open fields. This is a closed field. That means I'm, we're supposed to talk to each other. An open field is if maybe he was in the supermarket shopping for bread. Uh, that might be completely different. W- which do you think people struggle with more? Closed or open fields? I know like if I have to go to a party and make chit chat, that's hard for me. Well, people struggle with both. Well, first of all, people who find it difficult in a closed field, they're going to find it really difficult in an open field. If you're at a party and you know what? It, that's why I wrote my first book because... Uh, that people people get scared of walking up to strangers and introducing themselves. So why does that happen? Well, they're insecure. They've been brought up, told not to talk to strangers, as you mentioned at the beginning. I just tell people how to do that. Just go, you know. And it's, I talk about the the three second rule where you. But you know, this is this will take too long to talk about now. But, uh, but yeah, you know what. I spoke about this in Scottsdale, Arizona, when people talk about, oh, it's so difficult to find a, a part. This is a business audience. And I mentioned the fact, you know, I commute to Europe. I have three of my children. One lives in Paris, one in Amsterdam, and one in Lisbon. So I spend a lot of time, my wife and I spend a lot of time in Europe. You know what? Europeans socialize sometimes twice a day, or at least once a day. But they go to the cafe, they talk to people, they meet new people. They socialize all the time. North Americans maybe social. How many times do you socialize? I I mean, I, I have to force myself to socialize. The people in my audience, when I ask them, they might say, well, maybe once a month. Well, you know, it's a numbers game. If you socialize with new people once a month, you're just limiting your choices, that's all, and you don't get very good at it. If you socialize twice a day, uh, maybe have tea or coffee, meet new people, whatever, which my, my family do all of, they know tons of people. It makes it a lot easier to find a partner, a lot easier to find a business, a lot easier to do things, to travel, to move around, and have a, and have a life. By socializing. So that probably answers your question. We're just not, we're just not used to it over here. So it's just practicing. It's just practicing talking, being, being not necessarily interesting yourself, but interested. 
Correct? And, you know, absolutely. And the other thing is, there's no such thing as rejection. There is only selection. People are afraid of being rejected. Well, you know what? If someone is rude to you, that's their problem, not your problem. It takes a bit to get used to that. So go talk to somebody else. Obviously, in a closed field, go somewhere where people are supposed to talk to each other. Volunteer for something. Join a theater group. Join an improv. Do whatever. If you want to get good at meeting people, they're out there. They're absolutely out there. You could arrive in any town, small town in North America, walk into, I don't know, a cafe, find magazines, find local uh, uh, pay, newspapers or whatever, and find out what's going on and go there and get stuck in if you want to. If you don't, hey, don't whinge. It takes some effort. Scott Todd, closed fields or open fields? Which one do you struggle with more? Where do you even struggle with it? Oh, the open field. That's the, that's the, like, see, so like I, I, uh, you know, like Mark, I have no problem giving presentations, you know, like I have no problem talking in front of people. That's not the thing. But if, if there's an open room, then, you know, me, me either walking up to someone and talking to them or them walking up and talking to me, it's, it feels very uncomfortable to me. Um, that's a closed field, though. That is not an open That's a closed. That's where you're supposed to talk to each other. If you're in a room where people are supposed to meet, meet and mingle, that's okay. a closed field. It's safe. Okay. The expectation is you'll go up. You're not going to say, marry me and run away with me. You're going to say, look, I talk about using um, a talk show. I, I went on, on the Today Show, and, and, and Meredith Vieira said, okay, Nick, I walk into a room full of strangers. I've got 90 seconds. How can I appear socially smart? I said, number one, wear great clothes because more people will take you seriously. Number two, head for the middle of the room. Number three, move slightly more slowly. Number four, use the three, ask talk show host questions. Talk show host questions. Watch talk shows. Look at you guys. Listen to how you start asking questions. A statement followed by an open question. So she said to me, okay, what do we do about New York? I said, okay, I hear New York's a great place. If I only had half a day, what should I see? That's how you get somebody talking. You do the same thing in your, the event you're at where you don't want people to speak to you, make, you only got to practice one night, talk to seven people in one night, you'll be an expert at doing it. You have to force yourself and don't get drunk when you do okay, it. Okay, so like my, my biggest fear is, okay, I walk, to the, I walk to the center of the room yeah, and everybody is already chit-chatting with everybody, right? Yeah. Like everybody's already in a little group and then here I come and I'm like crashing this event, right? Like it's not, I'm not really crashing the whole event, but like, they're socializing. They've already started their conversation here. I'm dropping in. It really is an uncomfortable feeling just to go and start to drop in. And then what? I'm just sitting there listening. 80% of the people in that room or more feel exactly the way you do. They are just relieved someone's come up and spoke to them. So all you do is if, I mean, you look like you could be Danish or something. So if, if you, this was in Denmark, someone would just walk up when, the, when there was a pause in the conversation. They did, hello, I'm Nick Boothman. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from so-and-so, uh, you know, what, because that's what's supposed to happen at these events. People are supposed to meet each other. So you do that. You hang around there for 30, 40, uh, 90 seconds. Then you excuse yourself. So I'm going to get anybody a drink. I'm going to get a drink. And off you go. And you go do it somebody else. Do it seven times. And you'll be good at it. It's a piece of cake. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe I have to record or something because next time I go, I'm gonna record because see here's no, don't here's what I see. do it. Do it record it the following time. Okay, okay, but but here's what I see, right? Like and maybe maybe I don't really see it. Maybe it's my own my own limitations that I see. Okay. I walk up, you and Mark are chit chatting, you're you're you, maybe there's three of you, you're chit chatting, and I identify, I'm looking I'm like I, you know what I, I this group looks like fun. I'm gonna stop and See, now you guys are in a conversation. I, I just can't go and introduce, hi, hi, Mark, I'm Scott Todd. I mean, you got, I, I got to wait. You can in a closed field because you're supposed to talk to each other in a closed field. If, if you were at a podcast seminar or podcast event or whatever it is, and there were 75 people in a room and it was a, some, somebody was sponsoring the room for drinks, it, the expectation, everybody wants you at the party because you talk to people. Even if it's difficult, it's difficult, I've got a daughter who's now the global, uh, the global uh, VP of merchandising and marketing for one of the biggest high-tech companies in the world. She's just been headhunted away from a company in Paris. This, she wouldn't even go into a store on her own when she was a kid. She was frightened. To, she, she overcame it. She just made herself, forced herself to do it. And now she can walk anywhere, talk to anybody about anything. She just goes over assumes rapport. Remember I said about assuming rapport. Act like they're your long lost cousin. You say, hey, I'm Scott, how are you doing? I'm from, where are you guys from? Because you, it's, 
you're not going into someone's gang. You're going into a bunch of strangers who also just met. All right, Nick, I, I know it's got saying because I was just at a party and I hate the drop in. Here's Mark, a, I'm sweating just now, just thinking about it. I'm like sweating. Yeah, here's a group of guys. They already know each other. Yeah. They're already in conversation, right? And here I am awkwardly standing near them. They are not acknowledging me, right? Not acknowledging me. I'm standing there. They're being they're, 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 they're 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 conversation. What? They're focused on each other. They think you're fine. It's only you feeling that way. Just make them, just look. I think they're insensitive, Nick. I think they should acknowledge me. You, you, you tell yourself no. to shut up because it's in your head this is all going on. <laughs> I just say, I am going to do the three-second rule seven times tonight. The three-second rule is the moment I see them, the first person I see them, I go over and I just say, hi, how are you? I'm from, you know, I'm from, uh, from Phoenix. And uh, uh, da, 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 you know, just talk <laughs> about the occasion or the location. All right, all right. We'll Mark, get- Mark, Mark, Mark. I- I think that Nick can pull it off because of his accent, his cool accent, right? Like for me, I, I am from I did, I did live in England where a lot of other people talk yeah, the same see, way as I did. Yeah, you maybe, know? maybe that only works like when you're from out of the country. I don't know. Like, you're talking yourself out of it. You're talking yourself out of it. All right, all right. All right. People say to me, you know, oh, you've written these books about all these skills and how can I be better? This is the bottom line. Just get out and meet a few people become the one who goes up and introduces yourself not walking down the street not in every cafe you go to but where you're supposed to meet new people go up and say hi tell them your name where you're from and ask them a simple question about the location i had a terrible time parking how did it go for you that's all i i love it i love it i i get a lot of grief about, about this by the way um because I'm all, i am that guy i'm like i'm like the nicholas boothman of phoenix where I'll be sitting somewhere and I'll, I, I'll like strike up a conversation with somebody because I'm endlessly fascinated with people. But then like my friends will walk in like, why are you talking to everybody? You know? Yeah. Like, oh. that is, it's, the, it's those super senses I told you. It's your curiosity and your empathy and your feedback and your imagination and your enthusiasm. Really, that's all it takes. to talk. And, the, and the other thing is, of course, as you grow older, uh, it becomes easier. Older people talk to anybody, especially Brits. They'll talk to anybody. Start yakking like they've known each other forever. You know, so it, it will come to you eventually, but probably better to make it come sooner. I love it. I love it. All right, Nicholas Boothman, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives, and grow into that giant oak. Well, my tip is this. Be brave. Take risks, blame no one. Be brave, take risks, blame Blame. no one. Yes, because a leader, see, we live in a culture of blame. We ask to be leaders, and yet we live in a culture of blame. Someone is always blaming someone else for something. The moment you blame someone for something, you've put control of yourself outside of yourself. If you say you're late because of the weather or because of the traffic or because of the union or the politicians or the... Or, or the bling, or the or 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 or, or, or whatever you put you put the reason it happened outside of yourself. A great leader never blames anybody, and in the United States, look to the one leader you've had in the U.S. who I've never heard blame anyone for anything, and look at all the rest of them who are blaming everybody else for what's going on. You can never fix things if you blame someone else for them. It's it's brilliant advice. I love it. I love it. Be brave, um, take risks, blame no one. Be brave, take risks, blame no one. I'm going to put that on my desk. I'm going to write it down. Um, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark, uh, check, check out this book. You can find it on Amazon. Too bad they don't have the audible version of it. But uh, I, did, I, ha- I did enjoy reading the book. Some, uh, some, some interesting tips in there. Powerhouse Principles, The Billionaire's Blueprint for Real Estate Success. You can find it on Amazon. It's, it's actually written by uh, George Perez. He is, uh, he is may, maybe you could call him the Donald Trump of, of uh, Miami. He has just built Miami condos galore. Started off with basically nothing. Great story. Talks about his principles of, of what he did to do it. Thinking, you know, even talking about thinking big. So ch- check it out. 
All right, great. I'm buying it right now. I love it. Um, and the forward is by President-elect Donald Trump. Do they, have to re- do they have to redo all the books now and say President-elect or President? I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. All right. Uh, my tip of the week is going to be learn more about Nicholas Boothman at nicholasboothman.com. I will have a uh, link to his site. Um, and check out for sure the books. I, I think convince them in 90 seconds – uh, how to connect in business in 90 seconds or less. Uh, a 30 day training program looks awesome. How to make people like you in 90 seconds. Um, I'm, I'm sold. And, and you know what, Nicholas, next time I'm, I'm, I'm out, like I'm going to go out for lunch with my wife um, after this podcast. Um, I'm going to put a little stopwatch on and see how I can connect and how fast. And I'll email you and be like, okay, I'd like that. <laughs> took, me, took me 20 seconds. Like, yeah. yeah. But don't go crazy. Don't get arrested. But, you know, just just say hello to a few people. They'll be so glad you did. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, I mean, for sure. But um, what's your favorite opening line to get to know somebody? I don't have one. You don't have one? It just just depends on the the situation, if it's business Uh, situation. It's just assuming rapport. I mean, what would your opening line be with your favorite cousin? It wouldn't be an opening line. You'd just talk, talk about what was going on at the time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Just think of think you're sidling up to your favorite cousin or someone you've known for a long time, and just start talking to them. I mean, don't be weird or anything, but you know, if you if you're both looking in the same shop window, you can say, "Well, oh, that's quite yeah. What the heck's that?" You know. By the way, the way to to chat someone up in the supermarket, which is an open field for a guy, is to be standing around the vegetable counter and say, "How can you tell if these things are ripe or not?" That's all, and someone will still start talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, this is great. I, I really enjoyed this podcast. I learned a lot. Um, and I do want to let you know that you can automate your payments in 90 seconds or less with the sponsor of today's podcast, LoanGeek.io. Automate your payments, set it and forget it. No note setup fees, the best pricing in the industry. Um, LoanGeek.io. Get into beta wave two. Email support at thelandgeek.com for more information. Um, and if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, go to postingdomination.com forward slash thelandgeek. And also learn more about Scott Todd, landmoto.com, scotttodd.net, and give us some love. The only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Nicholas Boothman is if you subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It takes 10 seconds. Send us a screenshot of your review. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. I want to thank the listeners. I want to thank our guest, Nicholas Boothman. It's been a pleasure. Scott Todd. One, two, three. Let Let freedom freedom ring. ring. That was pretty good. That was good. Thanks, everybody.